Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm Major Rich Haar, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next guest speaker, retired Colonel Mike D'Arginio. The following video covers Colonel Mike D'Arginio's career as a soft aviator, leader, and innovator. Retired Air Force Colonel Michael J. D'Argenio was selected as an Eagle for his leadership and innovation. He was tasked by Air Force Special Operations Command to lead the rapid fielding and deployment of the U-28A Tactical Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Platform in the summer of 2005. Colonel D'Argenio started his career flying the C-21A, then joined Air Force Special Operations Command in 1993, joining the 16th Special Operations Squadron flying the AC-130H Spectre gunship. After combat deployments to Somalia and Bosnia, he transitioned to the 4th Special Operations Squadron, flying the new AC-130U Spectre gunship. Colonel D'Argenio's crews played critical combat roles in Albania and Kosovo. Then following the attacks on September 11, 2001, he led a six-ship deployment of AC-130Us to support combat operations in Afghanistan. His crew received the Distinguished Flying Cross for its role in the initial raid and airfield seizure of key Taliban objectives on 19 October 2001. In 2003, Colonel D'Argenio was tasked to integrate Air Force Special Operations aircraft as part of the Aviation Tactics Evaluation Group. In spring 2005, while serving on the Joint Special Operations Command staff, there was a significant shortfall in tactical ISR aircraft. Colonel D'Argenio reached out to Special Operations Command and then in turn to the Air Force Special Operations Command to solve the critical gap in combat operations. In summer 2005, Colonel D'Argenio was assigned as the commander of the 319th Special Operations Squadron and was immediately tasked with the rapid acquisition and building of the U-28A aircraft and the tactical ISR mission set. Leading a joint team, Colonel D'Argenio deployed the first two aircraft in June 2006 less than nine months from initial design. From fall 2006 to December 2007, the 319th Special Operations Squadron grew from six aircraft to 14, from 30 to 150 personnel, and filled with the Block 10 and Block 20 aircraft modifications. Fostering an unquestioned mission-first mantra, the 319th U-28 quickly became a required aircraft in the stack of the Joint Community's most critical missions. Colonel D'Argenio retired in 2013 following group command and 26 years of distinguished service, supported by his wife and four children. The Gathering Eagles program aims to capture the lessons and insights of air power leaders. The format of Colonel D'Argenio's speech today will be an interview on stage followed by question and answer session with the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Colonel Mike D'Argenio. Am I Mike? Well, thank you for joining us today, sir. Thank, thanks, Rich. And uh, first off, I just want to say, uh, that I'm uh, uh, honored and humbled uh, to be invited to the, to the event. Um, this goes contrary to the you know, quiet professional ethos that, uh, that, that we live out in our daily lives. So uh, I know you had quite a, a strong uh, lobbying team behind you, and I see quite a few subdued patches of criminals out there, so I, you had them to blame. But uh, I, I have enjoyed uh, uh, our conversations, and I appreciate uh, uh, your patience going through all of them. I also appreciate the uh, Air University and their work on, uh, uh, you know, making my ramblings over, you know, several hours into something that's somewhat intelligible to, to read. So, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, uh, when you ask me what, what, what we, what we want to do for the stage portion, 
And uh, really, I just wanted to kind of continue our conversation uh, and uh, just leave it to you to take it wherever uh, you think you'd like to and where the audience is, uh, it would be most interested. Uh, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth, so it's, uh, it's, it's in your hands. Uh, when I gave you that response, I did not realize that this would be a graded event for you. <laughs> so, uh, um, so no pressure, don't fuck it up. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to, to be here, so thank you. Uh, appreciate it again, sir. And uh, to the folks in the audience, uh, such as uh, General Holt and a few others that uh, helped convince you to be here, I really do appreciate that. As a graded event, uh, I needed someone that I could actually work with, and that's definitely been the case the last uh, <laughs> 10 months. So the quiet professional and, and someone that potentially talks too much, so we should be able to make this happen today. So, uh, sir, throughout the last 10 months, one thing that's been constant, we heard in your video, is that mission first mantra. So moving into the early part of your career, what started developing that mission first mantra that is part of the community now to this day? The, uh, well, for, for me, that comes really down to a clear understanding of what is a supporting force and what is a supported force. And uh, I think in the Air Force, that's a hard um, uh, thing to grasp and understand. I know certainly for me it was uh, coming in, coming into the Air Force, you know, for me it was, hey, it was all about me, what I wanted to do. And that was kind of reinforced early on in uh, even when you go through pilot training what's the first official photo that they take of you at pilot training It's the hero shot in front of your primary trainer so again it's it's you up in front and that's what you're thinking about and then you're fighting for what airplane do you want to fly what what mission do you want to do and you're fighting for that in, in your class ranking and then you get to your first squadron and it's okay what what positions do i need to have and what do i want to do to ascend to do what i want to do so i think for me you know it, it was a constant a path of maturing, uh, but that's the start point, and that's what I had to kind of understand and get through. Um, and that kind of goes across all, all of our disciplines. It wasn't until I really got to AFSOC where I, I understood more what a, uh, a supported force it requires and what a supporting force needs to do. Uh, so it wasn't until I got you know up close and personal with our CCT brethren and our JTACs and our STS folks uh, and, and the, the ground force assault, uh, assaulters uh, our helicopter assault forces and really got to understand really what that team consists of and, and what those terms and what those roles really meant. Mm -hmm. um, so as I took what I thought was a flawed understanding initially and uh, it matured uh, hopefully to the point where I was fortunate enough to, to be asked to command a squadron and uh, that's what we focused on. No matter what the AFSC, no matter what the duty of the job was, uh, it was what it, what is your role for mission success and mission impact? Uh, and, and that had to be you know, clear across the board. So uh, we trained everybody in every discipline that we could. We expected everybody to deploy, and everybody did. So they had that direct connection with, uh, with the mission and the impact. And that, that kind of lays the foundation for you know, that mission first mantra. It's, it's just natural at, at that point. Understood, and, and to kind of go off of what Chief Markham was talking about a little bit and along the mission first lines, there he is talking about boots on the ground in Afghanistan. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, in the interview you said your first deployment in AFSOC was actually as an LNO, and you learned some of those lessons firsthand about what it takes to understand that joint environment, understand what's going on on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that deployment was uh, um, probably my first real challenge in, uh, in, in my understanding and my perception of reality. Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, single seat uh, pilot training, uh, two seat airplane, first assignment, uh, get selected to go to AFSOC, thrilled with that uh, opportunity, get checked out in a 14 man crew AC-130H gunship, and uh, thought I understood what the team and the goal and the mission was, was about. And uh, then, you know, uh, 93 Task Force Ranger happens and uh, I'm on leave, I get recalled thinking, okay, I'm checked out, I'm mission called, I'm going out the door to go blow shit up. Well, not so fast. Uh, I got uh, tagged as the SOC sent LNO and found myself within the week on the ground in Mogadishu. And uh, that was a much different perspective for me. Uh, so now here I found myself newly checked out, uh, you, know, uh, you know, fangs hanging wide out, you know, wide open, ready to, to chomp in something. And I find myself in the joint environment uh, up close with uh, not only the ground user, but, but that battle staff and that command staff as an LNO. <clears throat> so I quickly learned that it wasn't me coming to the table and say, here's, here's my platform, 
here's my capability, here's everything that I can do, and here's what I'm going to do in the next 24 hours. It, it, that, that fell flat very, very quickly. Uh, it was a crash course in, okay, what do you need? What effects on the battlefield are required for you to be successful, not only on the ground, but on the, on, on the helicopter, uh, you know, pre-strike and post-strike. What is it that we need to bring to bear? How do I not only tie my platform, but all the other pieces in to be able to do that? So uh, that was my crash course in, 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 in the joint environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't have traded it for the world. It happened right about the right time, I think, when my head was probably the biggest that, 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 it, that, it, uh, that I really wanted it to be. And it was time to kind of step back and understand, OK, what is your role uh, in this piece and the supported and supporting forces element? Continue on that topic of understanding your role. What was, what was your technique as you became mission qualified in the AC-130 and then rolling into becoming a, aircraft, a mission aircraft commander? How did you take those lessons and then become, be able to run a crew of 14, 15 individuals? Um, yeah, first I thought the, the uh, being on a 14 person crew was, was gonna be a huge challenge, and, and it was. Uh, it was, um, I think it was like, for many others, that you're leading a team no matter what the size of the team is, whether it's a two-person team, 14-person team, 10-person team, ground team, aircraft, it, it didn't matter. Uh, the, the, the job was trying to figure out how to get that element moving all together. Uh, and it harkens back to you know, most of what uh, you know, Charlie and Mike was talking about. It's, it's trust. Mm -hmm. uh, it's trust uh, in the folks on board to be experts at their jobs. You're counting on that. Uh, and then you just have to put those pieces together at the right time, at the right environment. So, so keeping with the same the same theme of building that credibility, knowing where your role is in a unit. You went from the 16th SOS with an AC-130H, and then were part of that early days of the AC-130U with the 4th SOS. Can you talk about understanding what your role is as you grew in seniority and experience within the gunship? Um, well, I mean, it, you you climb the ranks, and uh, your ability to you know you become an instructor, you become an evaluator, your ability to impact. Uh, what's going on around you is, is, is significant. Uh, you know, for, for me, I wasn't the initial cadre for the uh, U-boat. Uh, uh, folks had gone out to, uh, to Edwards and had done that. Uh, so I was kind of that, that, that next wave of folks that were kind of tasked to uh, get the squadron uh, combat ready, uh, you know, pass you know, the ORI and, and uh, validate and get the, air, the, uh, the asset airborne and, uh, and forward. As you were becoming more experienced, became an aircraft commander, you started having some, there were some conflicts in the, in the Balkans and Eastern Europe. Uh, could you talk about some of the lessons learned that the community saw uh, in Mogadishu, for example, and then moving into an area where there were some potential surface air threats, for example? How did you, how did you manage that uh, crew as an as a aircraft commander? Um, well, I can tell you that uh, the, the Mogadishu environment was um, permissive, in my opinion. Uh, you know, uh, IR uh, uh, man pads and SAMs, but nothing uh, right. significant. So we, we had, from a soft element, freedom of, mo uh, of movement and maneuver in that, res in that respect. Um, that was <clears throat> different than uh, the Balkans, uh, Kosovo, uh, kind of an environment where Kosovo was more of a semi-permissive to non-permissive, depending on where you were involved in, in, in that country and in that conflict. So um, I think one of the lessons that I took out of the Kosovo experience was um, the training textbook doesn't always translate positively to combat real world operations. Uh, it, it just doesn't. Uh, so and oftentimes I saw and felt and was pressured by uh, other folks on the crew and, and adjacent crews to let the, the textbook chase you off target. Um, and, and I guess the example I'd use is um, Back when we were flying at that time, we did not have an electronic warfare range to go out and train on. There was no EW range for the gunships. So training to that environment was all simulated. We uh, simulated it in our ground and flight training scenarios. We would have an instructor pilot or an instructor EWO uh, provide the scenario, brief the threats, place them along the, the training routes and in the engagement areas, and then kind of role play on back of the airplane uh, as you go throughout your training scenario. So, it kind of it bred more of a black and white kind of an answer, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of pushing the limits. You know, you were getting through, checking the box, and, and moving on in your training syllabus. Well, when we got to Kosovo, uh, I kind of saw that smack us you know, right in the face in that particular environment. And, and, and one night in, in particular, um, we uh, 
we were assigned a series of targets along the Kosovo border. Uh, so the gunships were working in close proximity to the border, um, and uh, you know, we had three to four uh, airplanes launched that night. Uh, weather had rolled in, obscured all of the targets. Um, IR, uh, you know, SAMs were active all through the day and into the evening, uh, and the radar threats were coming up and popping off. They actually launched a, a couple, but the, the systems became quite active. Um, so folks were ingressing into the target, and we were getting the, uh, the threat updates. And uh, the radar SAMs, the, again, the textbook said, you know, if they're within this range in my target, I'm not going. Mm -hmm. So um, a good number of the, uh, of the other aircraft had turned back. Um, and we thought through it on the airplane and said, okay, I've got some real-time tipping and queuing that I haven't had before coming over the satellite feed. Uh, I, I, I trust the, the EWO, the electronic warfare officer, I trust him on his gear. Um, I trust him to, to identify signals. Let's plan an ingress and egress route uh, that we think will work. And then while we're doing that, uh, Nav, you better freaking uh, you know, get schooled up on the targets because you're shooting IMC through the radar uh, at the targets for that, for that night. So it was contrary to what the crew initially thought was the answer, and it was contrary to what they were trained and, and, and reflected to, to do. Um, but again, uh, we just you know, hacked the watch, worked through it uh, line by line, and, and uh, executed. Uh, we got a bunch of flack coming back in terms of questions as to how, what, and why. But at the end of the day, um, you've got to use all the tools at your disposal. You have to trust the folks that are on board with you. Uh, and, uh, and you need to execute the mission. Uh, so that was kind of my takeaway from that particular set of missions mm -hmm. and, and that environment. So putting your, your commander hat on, looking back at that time, what was the discussion risk to mission versus risk to force in, in your mindset? Um, <clears throat> Well, that, was, that particular set of missions probably isn't a great example because, you know, uh, risk to mission was, was not engaging the targets. Risk to force was, you know, yeah. us solely. Um, I would translate that over to one of the more complex uh, missions that uh, we find ourselves responsible for where the risk to force is, and again, it can't be focused on us. The risk to force is the, <clears throat> the, ground, of force, the ground of force element, uh, whether it's via convoy, whether it's by helo, uh, what is the risk that risk to force, what is that, that risk to the mission on target and egressing. Uh, so that's what has to be balanced. Um, it starts with, yeah, I want to take, you know, I, I want to take everybody on the airplane that I brought in target back with me, uh, but most importantly, and what we, you know, harped on and emphasized uh, every single day in the 319th was your job's not done until every single eagle is back in the wire. Uh, so that was the risk to force and risk to mission that we had to calculate. So, so the phrase we hear a lot in the U-28 community is once the boots are on the ground, know who you're working for. So uh, just kind of maybe continue that, jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, once the JTAC's on the radio with you, whether you're a gunship or U-28 or whatever the platform is, could you describe a little bit further the idea of uh, who has take on or who, who you're supporting at that point? Uh, without question, you're supporting the ground force commander, um, and that's through the JTAC, through the guy on the radio, uh, to that team leader down there. So uh, that's, that's where you're taking your direction from. That's who's, who you want to provide the best picture, the best uh, uh, you know, uh, situational awareness. Uh, and, uh, and quite frankly, uh, we saw it in the gunship community, and then we uh, uh, you know, extrapolated that into uh, the tactical man dire SAR community, is that you need to be an extension of that JTAC and of that ground force commander. So whatever load you can take off of him is what you absolutely have to do. Um, so, and that, when we uh, you know, activated the squadron, we kind of set up what we wanted to do short term, long term. One of the things that we absolutely wanted to be able to do was, was uh, um, uh, take that load off and, and be more than just you know, a, a, you know, a manned ISR platform overhead. So uh, that meant uh, training ourselves to be able to run the air stack, uh, to be able to shed that load, to be able to take, uh, you know, receive folks into that stack, brief them, uh, put them in a, in, at a whole point, get their SA up, uh, direct the various sensors on target, because uh, we had the SA to be able to do that, and let the JTAC focus on his close-in fight and work, work with that ground force commander. Uh, so again, that's something that we kind of did and focused on very, very heavily, um, and we, we did it very quietly. I don't think, well, I know, we didn't ask permission to send anybody to AGOS. We didn't ask permission to get an, a mobile training team out to, to Herbert and do a TAC A, FAC A training course for our folks. It's something we just said we had to be able to do. So, 
So you brought up a lot of uh, different tools to bring up your situational awareness. So looking in the uh, 1990s time frame, uh, could you, before we get into some of the innovation that happened with the U-28, could you talk a little bit about some of the, the barriers to innovation that you saw in the gunship or the, the, how long it took to get some of the new technology on to build that situational awareness? Well, yeah, I think there was, uh, I mean, SOF and AFSOC was uh, a lot more flexible and a lot more engaged than what I saw in AMC when, at, when it came out of my first assignment, so that was a given. Uh, but there still was a hesitation to, uh, to move fast. Uh, in terms of uh, modifications, equipment, TTP, you know, upgrades. Because when I got to the squadron, um, there, there, were, there was a good number of combat seasoned folks, but it was from an older, um, older series of conflicts. Um, so that was, again, came back to that's the way we've always done it, <laughs> mindset. And, uh, and, and that is, that's, that's just, that's not going to get you where you need to go. Uh, so, uh, very simple, um, why are we still using 40 mic mic MISH to, to sparkle and, and designate a target uh, for ground force? Why are, why are we creating that signature? Why can't, you know, we, we're, we're, I'm getting targets pointed out to me by the ground team using laser pointers and ISLAs mounted the, to, the, to the barrel of their weapon. Why don't I have something mounted to the barrel of my weapon that I can do the same thing from five, six miles away? Um, and so we asked the question and we got a, um, okay, it's going to take, you know, a couple years to work through. Well, that wasn't the answer. Um, so, uh, you know, Bob Monroe and a couple other smart folks at, at the unit said, well, I think we can mount this inside the, 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 the shell of a 105. We can put it in the bore of the airplane. We can trick the fire control computer to take out the lead and lag. We can point it where, where the sensor's pointing. We can do that. All right, let's give it a try. So, uh, so we went out to the ramp, uh, installed it. Everything seemed to work. Uh, we uh, uh, we did our safety check, and uh, and took off, and uh, it, it worked in the airplane as well. Um, but there was a hesitation uh, when we landed, and a few folks got their asses handed to them. But that's what needed to happen. So uh, that worked for a little while. But what it did it was it just woke up the the the, the headquarters machine, saying, "Yeah, you're right. We do need to be doing this better." Um, we can't take two years to crack into the, to the, uh, to the optics of a sensor to be able to do that. Let's figure out a way to do it now. Excellent. So, so uh, going back to a little bit of the, uh, the mission first discussion and, and the, the job fulfillment that that provides is, have, is having the understanding of what that mission is. Uh, pushed into late 1990s, could you explain a little bit of the iteration of the training scenarios that were going on uh, around the country? preparing for possible events, and then talking about uh, the, decision, the decision that you and your, your family ended up making based on that, on that mission uh, at the time? Uh, yeah, okay. So this comes back uh, on a personal right. level that all of us have to face and, and ask ourselves the question, uh, is the mission worth the price? Uh, what am I paying? What is, what, what is the family paying? What's going on against what is, what's the mission impact? And so for us, you know, for me personally, coming into the in, into 2000 and 2000 time frame, um, we at AFSOC and, and, and Gunship specifically had, uh, had trained and uh, prepared for a series of missions that we thought had significant impact and significant national level importance. Um, so we would, we would plan, we would go into isolation, we'd go out west, we'd rehearse, we'd build, you know, plywood mock-ups, uh, we would prove that the, that the plan uh, was feasible, suitable, and acceptable, and, and would succeed. Uh, and then we would see those plans go up to, the, uh, up to D.C., and the answer came back three out of three, no. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're not going to do that. Um, so in one instance, the, the, the solution was a volley of tea lambs over into a country, and it just, in our opinion, re rearranged the rubble, didn't have the impact that it needed to, or the, 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 uh, uh, the result. So, uh, so Lori and I, we, we talked about it, you know, we said, I just, you know, we are spinning our wheels here. Um, I'm on the deployment uh, bandwagon. It's a revolving door, uh, you know, gone better than, than half the year and uh, at 60 to 90, 90 day pops. And that was just continuous. Uh, so we say, hey, I got my health. We can, uh, I can get, get a job at the airlines. So I dropped papers. I turned down ACSC. Um, said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go make a life uh, for the family. Um, fortunately, that didn't happen. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, the event that turned that was the events of 9-11. So that turned it for me. Uh, similar, I was, I, I'm assuming that a lot of the folks in the audience, uh, you know, brought them, you know, into the military and energized to serve. So um, I quickly found myself back with a, a no kidding mission and a purpose. Yeah. And Lori and I, uh, we, we talked about that. And uh, it was, no, it was, again, focus was back to me and to what I wanted to do. And 9-11 uh, and just helped. It was the shock to help me flip that back in the right priority order for the family overall, uh, but uh, but uh, you know for the mission specifically. Uh, so we uh, we stayed on after that, and and uh, we're glad to still have you. So uh, the getting 9/11 occurs, and uh, at this point you're working in Group Standaval, and uh, just want to get an idea of what was it like uh, in the Fourth SOS, and then specifically for you as an attached air crew to the Fourth SOS, uh, working in the Standaval shop. Could you go through the kind of story of how did the 4th SOS get spun up to go down range relatively shortly after? Um, yeah, so I was in Group Stanaval. Uh, I watched uh, uh, a second airplane hit the towers on, on, the, on the news live and, and, uh, and immediately knew that uh, uh, we were, uh, uh, we were going to be busy and busy yeah. for a while. Uh, so all the squadrons started spinning up uh, and, uh, and, and getting ready to, to uh, deploy and to mobilize. Uh, and the fourth was was uh, in, in that same boat, um, so uh, we we got called in and uh, we started uh, crews started getting assigned and plans started getting put into place. Um, and uh, uh, I know you're baiting me with this one, aren't you? Um, so, uh, uh, but at somebody at the time in the squadron had decided that uh, that this this show was going to be for assigned air crew. Right. So attached air crew, uh, you're attached for a reason. Uh, we're, you're, you're not going to be included. Uh, we've got, we've got, uh, we, we've got to get on the road quickly. Um, so I left, I got out of the room and left. Um, and then I was promptly invited back, um, uh, as soon as they realized that. But, um, it was, it was a time to put together and address all the things that had frustrated us operationally up to that point. Uh, you know, we had, uh, you know, operating above 10,000 feet in an unpressurized airplane, uh, you know, we, we had done that uh, over, over, uh, over Bosnia and, and, and in Kosovo, um, and we had learned to operate in that environment. Uh, but they weren't, that, those missions weren't as much of an integrated soft package. Um, it was a lot of armed overwatch interdiction. Uh, so here we were going into uh, opening night that was going to be a rather sophisticated uh, ballet of pre-assault fires by conventional air forces, strafing uh, or, or, or bomb runs by, by B-1s, B-52s, that, and then the soft wave right behind that. Um, so we had to learn to work through a lot of things that had plagued us, just as simple as communicating on the airplane, on the hose, if more effectively with multiple radios uh, firing. Um, the you know, hit night for us. Um, you know, we can kind of move towards the, the you know the gecko time frame. Um, we uh, uh, we had to put you know two uh, gunships in close proximity over a target area to engage multiple targets simultaneously and be responsive for immediate uh, fire missions. Uh, we needed to figure out a way to to do that. Um, so, you know, I learned very quickly um, putting that together and then um, executing that was that. Uh, you, you absolutely just can't micromanage. Uh, you cannot micromanage. You have to leverage the, uh, the expertise of those around you, and that's exactly what we did for that particular instance. Uh, we had uh, a handful of us, not just pilots, but uh, focos, navs, gunners. Everybody went into the, you know, a room to whiteboard, and we figured out, hey, J-Fire doesn't cover this. How are we going to get max fires down, pre-assaults, immediate uh, you know, calls for fire, and then cover the, uh, the helo exfil? Uh, for that time on target, um, and we, we, we figured out a way that would work. Um, uh, we executed it, it did, um, and, uh, uh, but that was one of the, hey, don't micromanage, just get the smart people in the room and let's, let's figure this out. Um, you know, that's, that was one of the prep uh, elements going into Afghanistan. Moving out of that first deployment uh, to Afghanistan, kind of kicking off the war around the same time that Charlie Mike was there, you end up coming back and you get pushed to go to the special plan shop. I was curious uh, if you could talk a little bit about your transition to the, the wing staff followed by the uh, moving into the joint staff. Just talk about what that level of expertise is. How do you, how do you lead, in a joint, lead as in a joint environment to let the joint community know what the Air Force can bring to the table 
and that effects based uh, planning like you were speaking of earlier? Yeah, so I see timeline wise. Um, you know, I, I was at wing plans mm -hmm. uh, at, at the uh, first SAL uh, and uh, worked my way through for the OIF uh, um, you know, battle in, um, you know, with you know, Saddam and country. Um, you know, the piece I had to help work through was how do we use the combat air force, the CAF, to blow a hole out, get, the, get a uh, soft assault force in to multiple object objectives in that threat environment. Um, so that's, that was my task, and uh, we figured out a way to, to, to knock that out. Um, did OIF and, uh, and OEF and uh, was, was flying, and now I find myself uh, being tasked to go into, uh, into the JSOC staff. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was another instance of, of uh, maturing. Um, I thought that we had a, a very well um, uh, solution, a very well, well run team, very good solution at the, at the wing level. Uh, now I find myself at Abteg. Uh, for the air component uh, within SOF at the time, and I found the A team kind of staring me square in the face. What I, what I thought I knew, I had, had not a clue. I was working at, looking at a series of experts that were absolutely experts in every discipline, and that's what, that was their job, uh, and that was the foundation, the baseline. Um, so um, they understood uh, mission requirements, they understood support to the ground force element. Uh, better than I ever had imagined, uh, and I learned very, very quickly uh, to, uh, to, to improve my understanding of that. Um, and uh, again, you were, you were exposed to the joint tribe, so you've got the Army soft units, you've got your Navy soft units, and you had the Air Force soft units. So those tribes, each one of them are different. Each one of them plan differently, they execute differently, uh, they will follow their branch and sequels and adapt differently. Um, and you absolutely have to understand that piece um, going through. And I had no appreciation for that uh, um, prior to getting, getting into that position. Um, so again, it was uh, uh, how do I put the pieces together at that level? Thinking about this idea of building air-minded joint leaders, uh, looking back at your time, lieutenant, captain, early major, what do you, what do you wish you would have heard to prepare you better for that, for that joint environment? Um, well. From a staff perspective, uh, I hate to say it in this environment, but I wish I had understood and was more pro pro proficient at uh, MDMP, military, military decision-making process, uh, because that's the way that, that, that staff executed. And uh, um, so I had to learn that very, very quickly. Um, and in order to, to, to communicate effectively and at that level, I had to, I had to use their language. Um, so that's, that's something that I needed and didn't have, have walking into it. Um, I think um, I spent a good amount of time, uh, I think, apologizing for the Air Force uh, within the staff. And I don't mean that you know, pejoratively at all. It's just the reality of the Air Force thought differently and thinks differently, and their culture was, uh, was different. Um, and uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, the, some of the soft elements had little time or patience for that. Uh, again, they didn't want to hear what you couldn't do or why you couldn't do something. Don't say the word crew rest. Don't, you know, you know, don't, don't fall back in, 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 in that level of thinking. Um, again, project yourself forward. What is it that has to be done? Um, and uh, I, I wasn't prepared for that initially walking in. I learned very, very quickly um, and uh, um, it kind of took it from there. You talked a little bit in the, in the interview about a technique that you saw relatively often was people come up, ask you a series of questions, how do they get to know what level of expertise you have? Can you speak a little bit to that? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I experienced that first day. So uh, um, in, in that community, um, you'll, you know, first time you run, up, run across something, again, it goes back to can I trust the guy? Mm -hmm. is, is he an expert? Can I trust him? And there's an immediate test right off the bat. You're going to get probably five questions asked to you. The person that's asking the question, those series of questions, he knows the answers to at least two or three of them, and he's making sure you're not bullshitting them. Um, and uh, you, you get through that initial engagement, uh, satisfy them that you know what you're talking about, that you're, you're thinking and committed along the proper lines, and then everything else falls into place from that. But, uh, you know, I, 
you know, I experienced that the first day walking in the door, and I was like, what in the world? Why, why is he asking this? And then, you know, as I come to realize it, you know, after just a very short time, that's the way it is. So, so. Speaking of trust and, that, and then also a flat command structure that you're dealing with once you got to the joint staff there, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, General, General, how General McChrystal ran his staff and the idea of eyes on, hands off uh, that you got to experience firsthand? Yeah, I mean, I, I served under General McChrystal, I remember Craven, and, uh, and General Thomas uh, at, at various times in, in, in the community. And uh, probably, you know, beyond the mission focus and being able to technically put things together, um, the ability to uh, run a flat and transparent organization was a significant learning event for me. Uh, here I saw somebody with a global responsibility, a global reach, um, and uh, being able to put those pieces together every day without micromanaging. Um, and that was, uh, that was a significant uh, uh, achievement, in, in, in my opinion. Um, so, I mean, every day we'd go around the world, in one hour on a VTC, you would touch every node across the globe. And, and you would know exactly what's going on. You would, he, he as a commander would know what he needed to do to enable and to help. Um, it wasn't a brief back to, hey, how, you know, how great stuff is. It's no kidding. Uh, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're struggling with. Here's what we need. And, uh, and, and that, would, that would resonate and, uh, and, and folks would pick up the ball and run to knock those out. Um, so um, trust your folks, don't micromanage. And, and that was the way that, uh, that that General Crystal and Admiral Craven, you know, after him, continued um, to, to manage the force, and, and it was it was very impressive and one that uh, you know I carry in, in, into industry today. Uh, folks just can't quite understand how I, you can not all be in the same room, but get a common goal done and and, and execute. So. so pushing into 2004 and five, on the staff, this uh, shortfall starts being recognized in the in the tactical level of ISR. Could you speak to a little bit about the background and then what? what your understanding was as the decision was made to uh, fuel the U-28? Uh, well, uh, the, I, I, was at, I, was, I was forward at, at Bagram as the Jasoak commander. I'm sitting there living and breathing uh, the mission, the shortfall, and the tasks you know, for, from an ISR perspective and an execution perspective. Uh, there just wasn't enough to go around on, on a tactical basis. I knew exactly uh, what the ground force commander needed and wanted and uh, was familiar with the requirement across the board, but was pretty heads down in the fight. Uh, so when I got a phone call saying, hey, um, actually, we're going we're gonna to address this. We're going to uh, build an airplane. We're going to get it um, on the road and out the door in six months, and uh, we need you to come back and, and, uh, and, and, and figure it out. Um, so um, I was familiar with the tactical need and requirement and the way that you know, something like that could be employed. Um, uh, but then I got back to Hurlburt and uh, realized, well, okay, the AFSOC staff, SOCOM staff, uh, you know, they had briefed it and uh, had gone to Congress as a, as a stopgap mm -hmm. fill uh, for a shortfall on the MQ-1, MQ-9 ISR uh, platforms, both in crews and equipment. Uh, let's get something out the door as quickly as possible. Six months was the mandate. Uh, to fill that gap for the next two years until that production cycle, that training cycle could, could catch up. Um, so absolutely temporary in nature, uh, nothing more than a man predator, uh, get it done and get it out the door. So that's what was happening at the headquarters level. Uh, I knew very well uh, fully what was going on at the, uh, at the ground level. Um, so uh, uh, we, we, we inherited the task. So as far as describing that task a little bit, I know we have the figure up on the, on the board that everybody can see here. Can you talk a little bit about how this, how this team built that requirement and turned it into something different than a, than a man predator? Well, for, yeah, I, I, I asked you to have that available. And really, the, the, uh, the graphic on the right, if you could read it, if you can't read it now, I encourage you to kind of you know, get up close and look at it here a little bit later. But you'll see all the folks that made that happen at the operational squadron level uh, from the air crew perspective. You'll see. Uh, you know, four flights of eight guys that just busted their butt. Uh, you'll see uh, in, in the corners, you'll see, you know, 10 naval flight officers around that, that circle uh, who uh, picked up the ball, deployed for a year uh, forward uh, for the full 12 months and uh, manned the systems in the back of the airplane because uh, the Air Force wasn't prepared and ready. After all, it was just temporary, so why would we, put, why would we man for anything other than somebody to fly the machine? Um, so, uh, and oh, by the way, we just, we didn't tell anybody until 2012 that the, uh, 
uh, the thing that it did was ISR. We, you know, we, it was inter intra-theater mobility. So again, I, here I was, you know, handing the flag over uh, or getting, you know, getting the flag passed to stand up the squadron. Uh, I went look back to Lori and the kids and said, hey, you know, I took them out to the flight line and showed them a slick PC-12 with, you know, executive seats and stuff in the back of it. And they're like, hey, what, what do you, what, where's the, is that, hey, uh, I flew generals for a living when I first came in the Air Force. I screwed up. I'm still flying generals for a living. <laughs> Um, so that's what was said, and uh, um, uh, but we had to trans, uh, you know, work work the the tactical mission behind the scenes. Um, so that's everybody on the right hand side, and, and they they move mountains. Uh, organizationally, the way we pulled this off, uh, again, I'd, things lined up perfectly, um, you know, for a reason, and uh, we kept everything at the lowest level possible. I talked a little bit at breakfast with uh, Lynn Lee. Um, about this, who you know, she flew uh, RC-26 for a little bit, and we were talking about how do how do how did we get this done? And really, um, you can get for a for an acquisition program. There's you, know, you, you there's three things: cost, schedule, and performance. You can get any two of the three, but you're never going to get three out of the three. Well, for us, the only only one was schedule. We had to get something fielded in six months. That was the only thing that we were focused on. We were constantly trading off cost versus performance. So how did that work? We focused everything as we started talking at the beginning of this conversation was on the ground force commander. So to the Army and the Navy elements, that's where the requirements came from. That's who we were supporting. And that's, those are the tools that we need to be able to field to execute. So we got that from the ground up, cycled that up through the JSOC staff to the air component uh, at, at AVTEG. And then everything you see in that circle is what we kept down at the lowest level possible uh, to execute. Um, so you'll have Abteg, who was the subject matter experts to make sure that the ground force commander's requirements and intent were met and that we were satisfied, you know, threshold versus objective for whatever the requirements were. We had uh, Big Safari that was uh, the program office that was tagged to execute this uh, and, uh, and in a very short time frame. And then you had the, uh, the AFSOC guys and, and the Navy folks. Uh, partnered with us was the prime contractor, uh, SNC, and then we also brought in Avenge to do some uh, pilot training uh, uh, as we started ramping up the, the, the ranks. But the importance of that circle is that's where everything happened. Uh, we didn't go up to the wing and to the AFSOC and ask for permission and go through and, and have program elements and program you know, execution plans. Uh, I went there for resourcing, and I went there to tell them what it is we needed and, and, and when, when we needed it. Um, and that's what made it work. Um, we did everything at the unit level, uh, and uh, the big safari of PM, Don Maselli, uh, was outstanding at being responsive and allowing us to execute at that level. Uh, so we had a guy uh, at the SNC facility to the max extent possible, uh, you know, eyes on and, uh, and, and making sure that, you know, decisions were made appropriately. So as far as that timeline is concerned, could you speak to the importance of that 80% Let's roll out with it, talking with uh, Mr. Maselli and so forth. How did that work? Yeah, I mean, the 80% solution was all we were going to be able to get. Mm -hmm. So six months was the, was the mandate. We actually fielded it in, 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 about, in about eight, a little over eight. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, that was mostly because we had to get crews trained. Um, the first you know, six months, uh, nobody saw a mission piece of equipment at all. Uh, we flew the PC-12, flew the slick, slick airplane, we did MVGs, we did Airland, we did everything we could from a mission set perspective except the actual thing we would be tasked to do overseas because we didn't have the equipment. Um, so, uh, so guys were, were, were you know, at a disadvantage there. So 80% was all we were able to get out the door. Um, was it perfect? No. Um, did we have any SA tools up front in the airplane for the back end systems initially? Absolutely not. Uh, so our, you know, our guys, you know, working with SNC said, okay, just give me a network cable, give me a, give me a laptop, we'll work the rest out so I can have at least SA in terms of what the sensor's looking at, where I need to put the airplane, what's important, what's going on on the ground. So, uh, so those are the things that we worked out at, at the unit level. Um, you know, when the airplane was delivered, it, it, it flat out, it didn't work right off the bat. Um, sensor sight line was, was way out of the picture and, and we just, we couldn't train, we couldn't deploy. Um, so we had to push pause, bring everybody in uh, for about a 48-hour period of time and let the experts work through it to, to, to fix it. Um, but again, it was 80% is all you're going to get going out the door. 
Speaking as experts, I know a couple of the plank holders, John Ross and Russ Flowers are here today. Uh, can you talk about how you empowered that relatively small group early on to run and be the experts that you're, you're speaking of? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, again, uh, like Charlie, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I count on having smart folks there, and, and you just can't micromanage. You have to empower them and, and, and let them run with it, and that's exactly what we did. We had uh, a handful of uh, initial cadre. Uh, you know, six really strong, really strong performers out of, uh, out of the AFSOC black side of the world. Uh, we had the first probably 12 to 16 were all within AFSOC ranks, mm -hmm. and then we ran out of Schlitz pretty quick. Uh, AFSOC was standing up uh, the, the uh, third SOS, uh, bringing on the, uh, the MC-130 whiskeys, so they, they had a manpower drill that they just couldn't satisfy. So we went out to, to AMC, and we selected, hand-selected folks with not the best person, uh, and, I, and I want to emphasize that. We weren't looking for the best person. We were looking for the right person to come in and, and to do the job with the right attitude that could quickly ad adapt and, and operate on this timeline in this environment and then, you know, autonomously. So we, you know, first 32 guys, um, you know, in the door were, were tasked with that responsibility. Um, and they, they took the ball and ran with it. Uh, we just divided up what had to be done from A1 to A5, you know, and we structured the, the, the squadron that way to, to, to match, you know, our ground force elements, uh, joint elements, and then the, the headquarters element uh, at AFSOC to, to, to knock that out. So. so talking a little bit more about how this rapid growth ended up working to get from that 80 percent through that, that last 20 percent, could you talk to the training that the guys went down range and did, and then also how you started incorporating some of the younger, less experienced uh, aircrew? Right. I mean, as I said, you know, we, we didn't have any of the mission equipment, so how, how could we get the guys exposed to that? So uh, everybody went down range uh, for, uh, for several weeks to uh, uh, see the mission, uh, you know, live and breathe at, at the FOB. Uh, talk with the user, understand what was going on, and then fly in other platforms that were that were overhead close close to uh, uh, close to target, and understand what needed to be done. Uh, so that was a requirement for everybody before uh, they went out the door, regardless of whether they flew the mission airplane or not. Um, and uh, and that's just how we executed it. Um, we the only way we could go as fast as we could it, we did at that time was because we had experienced crew members in the door first. I didn't have to work on their basic flying skills, MVGs, uh, you know, they could talk on the radio, they can run the stack. We, we had that baseline experience. And then as the squadron got larger and we, the experience level began to uh, reduce, um, then those training cycles had, had to expand um, to be able to give them the, the proper foundation. Um, so as you start recognizing what that other 20% is going to look like and some of these smart guys, smart experts in the squadron have ideas, what did the rapid innovation process look like? What did you end up standing at the Combat Development Division? How right. did that process go? Yeah, so uh, for us, the way to uh, attack a problem or a shortfall uh, was to solve it at the unit level. Um, so we stood up a Combat Development Division, which is the first time it was done there in AFSOC for a flying unit, and other, other units had done it. but. Uh, um, that was, let's resource them with the technology and the tools uh, to tinker and to figure out what the right solution is. So we had kind of our own little mad scientist lab in the squadron. Uh, we had a set of porcupine antennas up on the roof. We had a full rack, uh, you know, simulation, simulated uh, set of equipment from the airplane. Uh, and then we were working to see what from the ground interface we, we could do to, uh, uh, to close that gap. And that was all done internal to the squadron inside that circle. Uh, so when we found a solution, we would try it out. Uh, we'd communicate it up through Domicelli and Big Safari. Say, hey, here's what we're thinking. Uh, let's get let's get the SNC engineers to validate it. Yep, that works. Or actually, no. Here's a better piece of equipment. Get that done in a very very tight circle, uh, and then um, not ask for permission. Just say, hey, th here's where we're going with it. Um, so we were able to uh, go from a block zero to block ten, which was a, uh, a glass cockpit mod to actually put. Um, you know, screens and interfaces for the mission systems up in the aircraft, because again, fielding the 80% solution, that, there wasn't even time for that. Um, uh, and that was uh, doing, you know, digital cast was just starting to be done, uh, but there wasn't a digital, a digital helicopter assault. Uh, we, were, we were talking our helicopter assault force onto moving targets using video, using MGRS on a chart, and doing a radio call and trying to map and decide where that guy was going to be next so we can you know, vector in a helicopter uh, VI to get to the right place at the right time. Uh, the guys in the CDD said, hey, this is stupid. 
we, we can do better than this. Mm -hmm. um, I said, okay, what do you need? I said, well, actually, we have everything we need. We, everything we need to do this is already on the airplane, minus some software. Um, so, you know, while we were afford, we talked to the, uh, the air mission commander for the, for the helicopter assault force, the DAVI guys. Uh, I said, okay, what are you looking at? What information do you need? When do you need it? How do you need it presented? Uh, and then we went back and had a really smart guy at, uh, at Hurlburt, uh, software code, uh, uh, Lou, Lou Pouchet, you know, did, did uh, some, some coding for us. He would uh, uh, zip it and send it to us forward. We'd upload it, we'd validate it, we'd, uh, we'd fly it, it worked. Oh, actually we needed to tweak a couple things, we sent it back to him. So this was a matter of three or four hours. Um, we were able to get that, that software tweaked uh, and that's, that's how we fielded and did our day VIs from there on out. So um, having, it, having the experts at the unit, and I can't stress this enough, you know, the, the, the biggest takeaway, and even as I, you know, uh, left the squadron and got to the group and, and, and headquarters level, um, and you guys will as well, um, you'll mature out of the squadron, and, but you absolutely can't forget that the experts reside in the squadron. The mission experts are in the squadron. So don't think the staff is gonna solve all the problems. Don't uh, think those are the only places that the experts are, because quite frankly, at many headquarters, folks have been there way too long and are stale. But the, the, the core competency and expertise for all of this is, is at the squadron level. So with empowering those folks in your squadron where all those great ideas are coming from, were there any, any examples you can give of, uh, I think the phrase you use is getting out in front of the headlights, and uh, how, how did that work uh, within the, the group wing and above? Well, I mean, to, for the folks to operate in that circle confidently, and, uh, and as you said, there's a handful of them here in the, in, in the, uh, in the room today, um, you know, it was imperative to me to, to find what the left and right limits were, um, to give them the intent and the goal and then to provide them the resources as best as I can, and then just stand back and just provide the top cover. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there were many times where, you know, we would do something rather quickly and get in front of headlights, um, but it was my goal always to at least have them understand that, uh, you know, if, come back and tell me if something goes sideways as quickly as possible, I know that's not always possible, uh, but, you know, I, I got your back uh, because we need to make this work. Um, so, you know, I've always, always thought you can't steer a parked car and you can't hang a guy for his first mistake. So if, they're, if you're going to solve something fast, you're going to run hard and, and you're going to get some bumps and bruises along the way. But, you know, um, defining those left and right limits and then making sure that folks to your left and right and above have your back, that's, that's what made it work uh, in hindsight. A lot of what you're talking about involves a lot of communication, knowing your people, knowing what they're good at. How, how did you extrapolate that out? as the squadron went from, to, from the 30 up to 150 by the time you were having your change of command? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the growth was, was quick. Um, and uh, as I said, the experience level started to, um, to, to dilute, um, but not in a bad way, just from the, from the foundation that we started, we had to learn to do things differently in terms of a training, in terms of prep. Uh, and, uh, and, and focus. The folks that we got in from the TAMI 2-1 uh, were just phenomenal. Uh, you know, fighter bomber guys that uh, had the, op the option to go uh, either to uh, uh, MQ-9s, um, U-28s, and I don't remember if there's a third choice in there, uh, but we had some really, really, you know, you know, long ball hitters come to us and, and help take us to that next level. Um, and then we had some really, really sharp folks coming right out of flight school um, that, that were able to adapt to those systems and do the mission very, very quickly. Um, I, I guess the, the point of your question, though, is that you, when you've got 16, 32, 65 folks, you can run a pretty tight core group. And as it starts expanding, that's, that's when I started leaning back on the lessons that I learned uh, from General Crystal and others in terms of, okay, this is going to get big. You cannot micromanage. You've got to be able to have a flat and transparent organization. So flat in the terms of communication, uh, on, a, on a regular basis and transparent is that everybody needs to know what the folks are doing uh, alongside. There can be no secrets, there can be no surprises, uh, and there can be no agendas. Uh, so that's kind of help, how it helped us get to, to that next level. So as this growth is going on, can you talk a little bit about how you stayed connected with a habitual training and operational relationship with the joint partners at the, at the base of the uh, figure here? Uh, well, um, 
we were hot and heavy combat, so really for the squadron it was 60 on, 60 off. So 60 on, about 45 days at home, and then 60 days back in the chute. Uh, and those guys did that for years. Uh, and, and really why it was 60 days is because they, they legally could not fly another minute um, uh, according to the Air Force waived regulations. Uh, so at uh, 60 days, they were pumpkins. They had to come back, get some time to clock, you know, click off the clock, uh, you know, get reacquainted with, uh, with, with the, the home life, and then get trained to go back out again. So um, not a whole lot of opportunity other than the forward uh, engagement. As the numbers increased and uh, we had the ability to do some training iterations back at home, then it was, okay, how do I habitually mate a squadron, a flight up with uh, a ground user, get them on the same rotation cycle so that uh, um, there's familiarity, there's comfort uh, with, with, with everybody from you know, the top of the stack all the way down to the ground. Um, so I, I, know, I, I know the person, not, you know, not because of the call sign, but because of the voice. So we talked a lot about the uh, operational side from the air crew down to the guys on the ground. Can you talk a little bit about uh, which we mentioned Don Maselli, but Mr. Hondo Gertz and what he was doing within uh, PEO Fixed Wing for how this acquisition process was enabled through Material Command as well as SOCOM? Yeah, so Hondo, P, PEO Fixed Wing at the time, uh, again, a lot of acquisition stuff, uh, try not to bore you, but uh, um, he moved mountains for this particular you know, activity. Um, he charged hard, he briefed Congress uh, initially, and then, hey, guess what? The, the, the airplane was actually making a difference, and we started off with six, and they wanted to buy 12 more, so he had to go back and ask for more money. Uh, we, we, the CDD uh, was working, churning out uh, better equipment, better refined TTPs, uh, and that, that all required money. Uh, so he went, he went to bat for that uh, right off, you know, uh, as, as soon as we hit, we hit go. So it's unusual that a squadron commander has a direct uh, uh, cell phone line to PEO fixed wing, uh, but again, in this situation, that's what made it work. Um, so, I mean, every, just the simple thing as I use the example of the, the glass cockpit, um, there was not a whole lot of support for improving the airplane and sinking money into it because it was just going to be around for two years. So why would we just get it out the door, let's fly the wings off of it, uh, and then we're done. Uh, but uh, we took the airplane down to SOCOM, uh, what Honda thought was going to be kind of a static display. Uh, to, for his staff guys to say, hey, look, you know, look what you guys helped field. And we did some of that for a while. Uh, and then uh, we, we tapped on their shoulders, hey, get, you know, get in, and get, in the, get in the right seat. We're in the right seat. Yeah, get in the right seat, we're going to take a ride. Um, so uh, we took off, we went over Tampa, and we ran a scripted scenario uh, to emulate what it is the airplane does overseas. Um, and we put him, in the, put him in the right seat, put the laptop in his lap, put the hand controller for the sensor in his lap, put the headphones on, gave him the helmet fire with all the, all the radios going off, and he said, holy crap, you guys do this every mission? I said, yeah, we do it every mission, and, and we need to be doing it better. Right. Um, so how do we fix it? Well, we landed, we showed him you know, exactly what the CDD guys had lined out. Hey, this is how we get from uh, this you know, block zero to a block 10 uh, you know, overnight, and uh, uh, he, 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 uh, he went to bat for it. So. So now we're getting an idea of how the operations uh, occurred. Can you talk a little bit about the resiliency piece? With you're dealing with people gone more than half the year, and uh, you obviously have the families at home. And uh, just a little bit of explain how you handled that as a commander. Yeah, that was that was a challenge. Um, and quite frankly, Lori and, and, and Beth, uh, uh, you know, Jay Haynes is uh, you know as my DO, um, and Beth his wife. They they bore the brunt of that uh, on the spouse's side of the house, um, and. Uh, Again, when you have a small unit, you can, you can have a very one direct interaction and you can take care of folks. As it grows, you rely on your flight, squad, your flight structure, and this is nothing new to, to anybody here in this room. Um, but we really wanted to be doing it better, not differently, just better uh, because of the, of the ops tempo. This is before you know, preservation of force and family and getting psychs into the squadrons and chaplains, you know, more, more of them and assigned. So we actively went out and, and, and sought that and put those in place. Uh, we had a, uh, a psychologist come to the unit um, and give a talk. I mean, the, the fir before the unit went out on the first deployment, uh, we, had a, we had a sit down talk about communication. Okay, what, is it, what does it mean to be an AFSOC? What does it mean to be no contact for th you know, 30, 60, 90 days? How does a family deal with that? 
um, and what are the tools to be able to kind of get through that piece. Um, and it was a really interesting engagement uh, that I learned a lot from um, because it wasn't just, hey, you know, you're not going to be able to talk. You're not going to be able to, here's the things you can or can't say. It was, hey, as, a, somebody, as, as the family member at home, um, when, I'm, when I hear your voice on the other end of the phone, this is what I'm thinking, this is what's important to me, and then flip that on, on its ear, okay, when I, you know, I'm the deployed individual, you know, maybe I don't, you know, I don't want to hear <laughs> the following list. <laughs> I don't want to hear that the car broke and the washing machine doesn't work and, you know, my kid just got kicked out of school. I don't want to hear that up front. So um, it was a really, really good engagement uh, on, on how to try to deal with that piece. And again, it was hands-on. Um, so uh, we tried to do that at, at, the, at the unit level. Uh, and then as the squadrons continued um, to grow and we went from one to now three squadrons, uh, my understanding talking with folks is that uh, those elements still exist and are still kind of uh, you know, solidified in, in, in the community. Um, Something is just as simple as, hey, you're not going to fly at this airplane or deploy until you fill out this following you know, se series of paperwork. Well, what is it? Well, I can't tell you that you have to fill it out, but I'm going to give everything to you. You're going to give me back a sealed envelope, and it's going to go in the first shir shirt's uh, file cabinet locked up. And on that piece of paper is, where are all the bank accounts? You know, what are all the bills that I need to be worried about? Um, if the worst happens, what are my funeral preferences? Um, who do I want to have you know, come, to this, come to the house? Are there people I don't want to have come to the house? Um, you know, all of those things we wanted to address up front uh, to put you know, the elephant in the room, address it, make sure everybody had that conversation. And then uh, again, you know, you know, God forbid that you know, something were to happen, we could go, we could pull that off the shelf, and we had a good start point. Because um, as, as Jay and I talked about it, um, in that instance, as a commander, you only get one chance to get it right. Mm -hmm. One. So. so, sir, before we open it up to some questions, uh, just kind of a final uh, question. A lot of folks here in this room are going to go take command here straight out of ACSC. Just wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe give them some maybe advice you you heard or maybe wish you would have heard before going to command, you, you just talked about building a lot of culture. And uh, how do you do that for these new commanders? Yeah, I mean, the commander owns the culture. Um, there's, there's no way around that. Um, and most units emulate the personality and the attitude of the commander. Uh, and that, you just have to accept and deal with that. That being said, um, you know, I, one of the things that was told to me as I was coming up into the squadron command was, you know, that's all true, but don't change who you are as soon as you get into command. You are hired and put into that job. You are selected to do that, have that duty based on who you are. So there's no need to have some metamorphosis, you know, change into somebody, oh, I'm automatically a commander, I need to be acting the fight. Yeah, you should be acting that way, you know, to start with, you know, to get in there. So your troops, your airmen are looking at you to continue to lead and, and to and to be that individual. But again, you own, you own the, uh, uh, the, the culture. Um, so you, you've got to manage that um, actively. Um, so I, I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't micromanage. Um, and uh, uh, your comment of eyes on, hands off from General Crystal, um, you know, you, you've got to leverage that. So, sir, are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. So uh, if anybody wants to uh, go over to the side wall, uh, if anyone wants to stand up right here in the front row, we can work that too, but give us uh, 10, 15 minutes of questions if able. It's time to wake up. So he does know a few people in the crowd, so he might call somebody out if we don't get one right away here. So. Tra you, know, you know Travis Sheets, I know. Travis, so, yeah. indeed. <laughs> we've, we've crossed paths twice in life. Sir, can, uh, you know, there, this works. Uh, you, you were my first commander. Myself, Val Ferrer, and John Vandenbenen were the first UPT graduates. Um, I understand there were some A1 discussions that went on when Val showed up, and then probably a lot of uh, critical thinking and evaluation about how these new folks would, you know, filter into a new squadron. Each of us were late 50s in the Slayer numbers, so, you know, we were right behind that first 30, and uh, you guys were still running hard. 
looking forward to how all of, all of us are going to move forward as commanders and staff officers, seeing those young people come into jobs that you may think will be overwhelming to them. What advice, looking back on that instance, would you, uh, would you give them? Uh, well, first off, uh, don't sell them short. Um, and I think there was a perception that I did a lot of that up front. Uh, and, and subconsciously, I think I did. Um, but in, in reality, um, as I said earlier, uh, we, had to, we hit the ground run hard, we hit the ground running, and we had a very short timeline. So we relied on the experience of the aviators um, to come in at the graduate level and then to, you know, to do that mission uh, to, for the ground force. Having yourself and, and, and Val and, and the others come in, um, you know, just kind of you know, caused us to calibrate that thinking a little bit differently. We had to really look hard, okay, what, what's the gap in the tool set that the guys that we originally came in the squadron with, what's that gap and how do we best fill it uh, for uh, the younger, less experienced folks? And uh, um, I think the bulk of that you know, was, was airmanship to a certain extent, and it was uh, the mission. I think once you guys got you know, air under the wings in that platform and, uh, and really connected with the ground force and the mission, the rest of it just kind of clicked. Uh, the technology side, the, you know, all that stuff, you guys took to much, much quicker than, than, than I did or envisioned. Um, so. so you know, word to everybody out here is don't don't sell folks short. Uh, you know their capabilities are uh, go well past what you what you offer them. Um, again, just give them the tools to succeed, uh, and and they'll surprise you. And you guys did so. Thanks. Hey, sir. Thanks for coming, um, Jerry Gabe, Flight Thirty. The U twenty eight is a phenomenal ISR and, and targeting tool, um, as you well know. Most tools are only as good as the crews that are employing the tool. Can you talk through how you prioritize the specific um, layout of sensors and weapons? Was weaponizing it uh, at the front of your priority list, or did you put out a platform and then come back to some of these things, especially like dual sensor, um, multi-ant, and weaponization? Well, um the answer, well, the short answer is we had to get the, the, the threshold out the door. Um, even Travis and Val and folks that went forward on their, their initial field trip, as we'll call it, you know, forward uh, in, uh, to Balad and, and, and flying in that environment, watching the other platforms and the ground you know, scheme maneuver uh, pan out very quickly, we realized that you know, one sensor was not going to be enough. Um, and uh, the, the, your job of rack and stacking the, you know, the sensors and being the, the warden over, over target um, was significant. So as much of that as you can do organically, the better. Um, so uh, there was absolutely the, the, the intent to mature the airplane. Now, it, as when the airplane got to us, uh, it was expected to fly seven hours. Well, it did five, four and a half, depending on who was on the, or four, if you had the really big guys. So the difference between my lightest crew and my heaviest crew was an hour's worth of gas. So as you know, you've got, you've, you've got you know, a whole crewing you know, set of gymnastics to do to maximize that. Uh, it's just the reality of flying a small airplane. Um, you're burning 300 pounds an hour. Well, what's, what's, what's a big guy with all this kit? Breaking 300 pounds. So, um, so the, the concept that we'd ever be able to fit a second sensor on there was just completely alien to us. Um, but then as the contractors and as Big Safari and those guys started nibbling at it, getting you know, back to Pilatus and understanding what the airplane could and couldn't do, we've got waivers for that airplane that, you know, that, 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 that OEM never would have envisioned. And uh, it's all done on the military side. So, uh, uh, so that's how we got through a lot of those things. So yeah, it, the second sensor was, was, a, was a huge piece, and the ability to data link and do everything digitally was the next big hurdle that we knew was coming and that uh, we empowered the CDD guys to fix and figure out. So, you know, the idea of having Link 16 and saddle and everything else on the, on the, radio, on the airplane was, uh, was not even considered. Uh, but when we had one of the CDD guys sitting in the talk, in, at the at the fob there in the green zone in in in, uh, in Iraq, 
and saw a stinking saddle radio on the fire's desk and realized what they were pulling in off of that, what they could do. We're like, okay, it, it's, time, it's time to mature. And uh, there's no reason why, although we're not active on the link, that we can't be pushing all this data. Over to you, Jerry. Good morning. Appreciate you coming to share your wisdom with us. Matt Volk, Flight 17. Uh, we've had a lot of joint leaders, senior leaders, come and talk to us about how important it is to be bold decision makers, make bold decisions. And then a lot of frustration occurs when we see the exact opposite being reinforced in actual real world. Uh, as somebody that's been, you know, air quotes, fired multiple times and also promoted for being that bold decision maker and leader, how, when, where do you actually do that in practice in the real world versus just talking a big game and then doing something different? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting point um, because, yeah, I mean, fired and hired a couple different times. I know Don Maselli was fired and hired a couple different times. But the reality is um, you need to be bold, you need to execute the mission, and your folks look up to you to do that. But you can't do it blindly. Um, and I didn't do it blindly, although it may sound in this conversation, um, there has to be a, a regular and honest conversation with your boss and your boss's boss. You've got to keep them informed uh, to the level that you can and keep the momentum moving forward. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, um, as commander, you know, there is the mission. Uh, but uh, let's just, you know, hey, as the ops, so what's your job? Your job is, for, is to execute ops and to make sure the commander uh, you know, is able to do his and make him successful. Um, so that communication uh, upward has to happen. Um, and, and I didn't take that for granted. Uh, I didn't ha always have the opportunity to do it. And, uh, you know, my ops group commander reminded me a couple different times, hey, Darge, you're, you're a squadron commander. I need you at the squadron you know, commanding the squadron, and because we, we started the 60 on, 60 off, and he saw me for maybe, you know, three weeks or so, you know, before I headed out the door again. Um, but again, it goes back to that flat and transparent mindset that you can execute distributively, but you've got to keep your boss and your boss's boss informed. So, uh, General, or, uh, uh, Colonel Brosnick uh, at, at, the, at the wing level, um, you know, he, we, we would have very frank and honest discussions. And again, that, that graphic, that, that would not have happened um, unless you had folks that supported you at that level as well. Um, it's when they don't is when you have, have the real problems. Um, so uh, it wasn't asking permission a lot, it was, but it was informing. Uh, and, uh, and they were um, uh, smart enough to realize you know, how much rope and leash to let out and let us go. Um, and uh, if you're successful, you know, they're good. I mean, it's, it's funny because this, the, the whole U-28 story, if you will, um, you know, success has many fa fathers and failure is an orphan. If this thing had failed, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about any of this right, right now. Um, and nobody would have, you know, taken credit for any or said that they even touched it. Um, but, uh, uh, but keep them informed, making sure you've got a good, smart plan. Uh, and as long as you continue to be successful and uh, um, they'll let you run. We have time for one more question. Right here. Sir, Cadet Perez, and um, for myself and many of the other cadets here, this is you know, the first time we're leading large organizations, and you, you talked briefly about having a flat, transparent organization, so I was wondering if you can elaborate on the challenges of creating that environment, and maybe some of the pros and cons of that environment compared to other organizational structures. Uh, well, again, uh, we talked a lot about you know crews and airplanes and that kind of stuff, but uh, um, this conversation goes through every AFSC, every specialty in the in the unit in the squadron, um, and it, they all have a role. Um, you know, our intel officers and, and, and personnel, for instance, uh, they weren't in the squadron; they were attached to us from you know from from the intel group, um, but they were forced to operate at a much much different pace and much different level than they had in the past. Um, so how do we bring those folks on board? Uh, how did we, you know, get the basic support structures in place? I mean, shoot, that picture you saw of, the, of me uh, assuming command at the flag, we had, that's C.D. Dunham, we had to rent him. We had no enlisted in the squadron where he first stood up. You know, we were a bunch of, like, 18 officers trying to figure everything out. So, um, but we brought all those folks in, and uh, 
you know, the, the, the flat, um, that's, that's communication. Um, and that's, um, you can do that distributively in many different ways. Uh, you know, SOF is the command of ETCs, uh, and we executed those regularly. Uh, that was the only way that we can tie all of our distributed nodes together. Um, so uh, a SOAS level VTC is absolutely required on a regular basis. Uh, and, it, and it can't be a long drawn out event. It's gotta be quick to the point. Um, and then the transparent side of the house um, is absolutely understanding and knowing what everybody is doing in their individual lanes um, and, and putting those pieces together. Um, you know, I'm not sure I've given you enough information based on what you've asked, but um, uh, each, into, each organization is gonna be different. You're gonna figure out that battle rhythm, um, but it's gotta be across the board for everybody. Uh, and, uh, and you're gonna lead that battle rhythm. You're gonna set that, that tone and you're gonna set uh, what information you need and when and make sure that folks aren't keeping things to themselves. Uh, it's not, from, and not, not, not from your perspective, but for everybody else that's at every different lane next to them. Uh, that's where you start having problems. All right, sir. Well, really appreciate it. I just want to, I want to let you know that last 10 months have been a real pleasure to not only get to know you, but also to hear this story. And most importantly, this story is now your story, your career is now recorded in the, in the book that we have. So now everybody going to initial call, whether it's down at Herbert Field or wherever else, can read that story and hopefully get some of these lessons like this, like this crowd just got. So again, just want to uh, give a round of call, uh, applause to uh, Colonel D'Arginio and say thank you. Yeah, thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it, sir. Uh, yeah, for, uh, yeah. Thanks. Good, I think we did it. We hit the timeline, too. Yeah.